All the big calls on all the big races. Welcome along to Watershout, brought to you by the Racing Post and Betfred. We've got plenty to get stuck into over the course of the programme. We've got Andrea Rizzini, who will be joining us. We've also got a top panel, who I'll introduce in just a few minutes. And we're going to be focusing on five decent races. Of course, it's the Coral Eclipse, one of Sandown's big days of the year, and some good racing that's taking place on a three-day fixture up at Haydock. So don't forget, first of all, this is a like, subscribe, share, and comment programme. We want to hear from you, and we want you to be involved. Here's the panel. I know you've been waiting for it. Paul Keeley beside me. Good to have you here. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to it. One of my favourite days of the year. Uh, Coral Clips meeting at Sandown. Always go. Uh, some cracking races. Obviously, you know, you very often get the small field for the, for the Eclipse, which is what we've got. But there's some uh, cracking competitive races there as well. And I love the card at Haydock too. It's going to be boiling today and not the case tomorrow. This is, uh, this is the issue. The, the one <coughs> thing that uh, I suppose frustrates punters more than anything else is the weather forecast that has thunderstorms in it because we don't know whether they're going to get them or not. Now, you know, I spend a lot of my time um, studying racing and looking on weather websites uh, far too much, uh, to be honest. But, you know, last night, for instance, Thursday night, uh, there was there were some sites forecasting 20 mil at Haydock during, before and during racing by Friday morning, uh, they're forecasting that rain to arrive pretty much after racing. Mm. Uh, and yet, while there was only showers forecast at Sandown, there's now a suggestion they could get 10 mil before racing. So who knows? I mean, the problem with thunderstorms is they either hit or they don't. Uh, and they deposit loads or they deposit nothing at all. So <laughs> it's in a bit of the lap of the gods, isn't it? All good. And tell me, are you going to be on best behaviour tomorrow? How's the punting brain? Uh, not good at the moment, actually. It's some frustrating, you know, again, you know, it, it always seems to come back to haunt me. Horses that I back from one, they come out the next time and win and call in the wind did that. I mean, I love calling the wind as well. Like, you know, to actually miss him when he wins a race of 14 or one uh, sort of annoyed <coughs> me. Uh, and I haven't had any winners since. So uh, uh, always go in fairly confident at Sandown because I love Sandown. So um, we'll have another go. And to your left, Robbie, welcome along. Yeah, nice, um, uh, um, nice to have a fresh face in the studio. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, Thank for, you. Looking forward to it, obviously, uh, as Kills alluded to. Um, this is my first week back after a week off, so I'm now very much back in the swing and hoping to find some winners for us. Do you take a week off and literally... Oh, yeah, I get oh. away, yeah. I mean, I, I'll like... I, I didn't watch a race, to be honest. Like, I just watched them back when I, when I... I think it's good to sort of separate work and pleasure. Yes. So you're back on well, it this now. Is pleasure, this is pleasurable for me as well, sat in here, obviously. But, yeah, very much <laughs> back in the groove. It's not a real job, Robbie, is it? End of the day. It's not really. No, nah, it is kind of hard to switch off, isn't it? But that's why we're here, isn't it? We've got the passion. So you're on your A-game, you think, and you're firing I think, I think the so, weekend. Yeah, I mean, I was carrying the tipping team at Royal Ascot, to be honest. So, <laughs> yes. so hopefully more He's not wrong there. He's definitely not wrong there. I don't think a lot's changed since, has it? It's annoying. I finished seventh. I mean, I'll move over your heads just to deny a little bit. <laughs> I finished seventh in the work tipping competition out of 400 people just outside the money. But I'd like to feel I'm still in form, even with a week off. And completing our lineup, it's a very good morning to Matt Humes from Betfred. How are you? I am, yeah, thanks for having me back. Awful last week, I think I put up three and it might still be about five runners combined, so absolutely shocker, but yeah, come on Robbie, work is pleasure, isn't it? It's a great job, we're not down the mines, we're trying to find winners, this is great, you go hand in hand, surely. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair point, Matt, I should, should pay a bit of respect to the position we're all in, so. So come on, tell us, what have you got offers-wise, hit us with something good for the, for the weekend? Well, we're going to hear from Andrea Zini a little later on as well. So we'll be top price on his rides at Sandown. He's gone to both Lady Amana and uh, Scent and Glide as well. So we'll make sure we're top into price on those for a short period uh, this evening. We're going to be four places well online in the Coral Charge. That is wide open, isn't it? We'll talk about that. Space we're going to look at shortly. But 11 runners, four places. But even so, you're still not guaranteed to get into the frame. That really is wide open. 11 to the field right now. And the five places on the old Newton Cup as well. Another big betting race. Weekend. Those punters, we love those big field handicaps. So this is what we've got coming up on the show. We've got five races that we'll be focusing on. Two of them, they're big races from Haydock and the others coming from Sand. And of course, the feature of the day is the Coral Eclipse. Well, there isn't a better time to sign up to the Racing Post Members Club with 50% off your first three months. Check this out now.
Well, delighted to say that we're joined by jockey Andrea at Sini. Andrea, how's the season going for you? It's a super busy time of year. Yeah, no, um, it's quite obviously it's a very busy time of the year now. Um, I had a, I thought a very good start of the season, decent start anyway. Um, you know, riding quite a few winners and um, obviously winning the Yorkshire Cup. That that was a nice start and won the German Guineas. So it, it was quite a good start. But then obviously through suspension and things, it just sort of um, I had ten days off because uh, I was obviously suspended, and I came back again, and then another four days off uh, through suspension again. So it's been a bit of a stop and start thing, but uh, hopefully we will get the ball rolling now and uh, yeah, and um, trying to ride as many winners as I can. How are you getting to grips with um, with the stick rules? How does that generally fit with you? Um, you know, it's, at the beginning it was a bit of a struggle. Even now, um, I think with the new whip rules, um, the, the main problem was the it wasn't so much the number I, I think the numbers never it's not really an issue uh it's just everything else that comes with it a bow shoulder high it, you know time to respond I, I i found it difficult especially you know with time to respond and and especially when you're riding a la you know a lazy horse on on soft ground and i got done a couple of times because of that and uh and obviously it horse in the correct place that that's another thing that uh you know that I struggle with sometimes, but um, yeah, listen, as, as it's been well, very well documented. I think the problem, like I said, is not the number of, you know, time to respond. Obviously, I have to think about it a bit more. It's just the penalties are, are quite harsh. <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. You have a day off today, which is probably rare at this time of the year, along with the suspensions. Um, who are you riding out for weight wise? You're quite lucky on that front, aren't you? I try to keep myself busy as busy as I can, and you know I ride work with uh, different trainers. Um, I don't like so Marco Botti, Chris Wood, and uh, William Knight. Um, like I try to put myself about as much as I can, and no, like you said, I'm very lucky with my weight. i have never uh, have to struggle with it. Uh, obviously, I keep an eye on it every single day because you know it is important to keep your weight down and uh, be as, as comfortable as you can. And uh, but. I can't complain. Like I'm, I'm, I'm one of the very few lucky jockeys that doesn't have to really worry about his weight. Now you're just back from the Palio, aren't you? In uh, in Siena, a group of you went over. I think you went last year as well. Doesn't your brother ride in that? That just looks madness. Would you be brave enough to do something like that? <laughs> I, I wouldn't be brave enough now, Emma. No, um, no it, it, it's good fun. Um, I've, I've been there quite a few times, and uh, and uh, somehow, obviously, I, I was suspended. I was, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and obviously James Dolan, he he was off, and obviously James Spencer as well, and and a few of our friends, Kieran Maher and Will Byrne, you know, they they all were very keen to go and watch it, and uh, because I've been there many times, uh, I thought it was a good idea for them to come with me because I obviously I knew where where to go and what to do, and uh, it, it was great fun. We were there for two days, and lucky enough, my cousin won it again, so that's his fifth tally on the row. He's won it ten times. That's amazing. Yeah, he's won it. Yeah, it is. It is. He's won it ten times so far. Um, yeah, the record is fourteen. He's only thirty-seven years of age, so hopefully he can he can break the record at some stage. And how do you train for something like that? How does that work? It's mad. obviously the, you know that they they, they uh, don't use saddle, um, so they have to ride bare back. So physically. It, you know, it's a big ask for them because, like I said, you know, your legs got to be strong and they, they train very hard. I see my cousin, you know, they try, they train, like, not just in the gym, obviously, to keep the weights down and whatever. It's just riding horses in, like, three or four horses every day, bare back, just to get used to it. And, uh, but no, it, it's something that we're very lucky now with a new documentary, uh, and obviously I think it's on Netflix and also on Amazon Prime. A lot of people got to know a lot more about the paleo and understand a lot more because when you're trying to explain it yourself, it's it, sometimes people find it hard to understand. Well, I think if you actually watch the documentary, you can see the inside of it and uh, uh, it is good. It's very good. <laughs> well, back to you. Uh, busy day at, at Sandown tomorrow. You've got six rides. We'll sort of flick through most of them. Some you have ridden and, and, and some you haven't. Um, we'll start with Lady Himana in the opener. Um, mm -hmm. Drawn one, 
in the listed race, won, won a listed race over course and distance last time. He's one of the slightly bigger price ones, but struck me as one with a chance here. Well, yeah, uh, like you said, I think uh, the course and distance is obviously very important. Um, she, she, she won a listed race there the last day over five on, on sort of quickest ground. If the ground is, sounds like a bit on the slow side of goods, I, I know it's going to be hot today, so it's going to be interesting to see what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. Um, you know, she's, she's the lowest rated filly in the race of a mark on 97. Um, but, you know, she's a course and distance winner. She's a three-year-old getting weight of the older horses. So, uh, and Carl Burke is in great form. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. Spirit Catcher in the 225 has finished second on his last three starts. So aiming to go one better there for Charlie Johnson. He's consistent. He only just got stopped the last day at, uh, at the Newcastle. Um, he's only, he was only beaten by nose. But he's a very consistent horse. It, it's a very competitive handicap. He's obviously running in slightly easier races. But, uh, you know, he's consistent. And he's getting, you know, he's only carrying eight six. So it's getting quite a few weight, uh, quite a bit of weight off of, of the top horses, so which which whole helps. And uh, yeah, no, I, I'm confident he could be competitive again. Big chance, I thought, on Stent and Glider. Probably your best chance in the three o'clock for Hugo Palmer. Yeah, she's. Um, I quite like the filly. She's. Um, she actually ran a very good race in the German Guineas um, when she finished second. Mm. She was. Um, you know, the track was quite tight that day and the winner probably got the run of the race. But uh, I thought, you know, dropping back to, you know, to at least a level, she's, she's, she's a mark of 103. I'm, I'm sure she's a top rated filly in the race. Um, she's very uncomplicated. She's just got better with racing. And hopefully tomorrow could be uh, a day where she can actually uh, win a Black Cup race. Mm. And I suppose your chief opposition has just come out. So uh, I think you're pretty sure to go a favourite for that. So no, a, a big player there. And then Mokta Saab in the, in the 4.15 for Billy Knight. Know much about him? Uh, not much about him. I've obviously, I've seen him running plenty of times. Um, he's, he's dropping back to 10 furlongs. Um, he's probably, he stays a little bit further, although he's one of the 10. It's, an, it's a handicap. He's a very competitive handicap. And hopefully he's, he's on, a, on a decent mark. They can be competitive again. The last couple of races, Empty Metaphor and Abu Royal. Do you know much about either of them? Um, MT Metaphor, he ran in the jersey the last day, uh, it was well beaten. He came from Ireland winning the novice over seven furlongs uh, on soft ground. So it's up against it, back in a handicap though, so hopefully he'll show a bit more than what he did the last day in the, in the jersey at Ascot. Quick word on the Eclipse. Um, sadly, you don't have a ride. There's only four runners and obviously it does look a match between, um, between Paddington and Emily Upjohn. What's your take on this, three-year-olds against four-year-olds at this time of year? Well, you know, it's only a small field, like I said, with four runners. You know, it's going to be interesting to watch tactical-wise and what's going to happen in the race. But, you know, they're, they're two very, very good horses. Obviously, Paddington, he, he was very impressive when he won at St. James's Palace. He's, he's getting, I think he's getting seven pounds from 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 um, Emily Upjohn, which is, which is a lot of weight, but... At the same time, you've got to be impressive with the, with the mare. She, she's a very consistent mare. She, you know, she was very impressive when they won the coronation at uh, Goodwood. I know she's coming back in trip, but uh, she showed a very good turn of foot when she won the coronation. So it's going to be very, very interesting to a race to watch. But maybe if I had a choice to ride one in the race, I'd probably ride Paddington. He looks the, the new kid on the block. Brilliant. Andrea, thank you very much indeed. Enjoy your day off and good luck tomorrow. No problem. Thank you very much, Emma. Great to hear from Andrea there, speaking about uh, his six rides at Sandown, also a bit about the Palio, which is fascinating stuff. I'm actually quite intrigued now to go and check it out on Netflix. I know you have to be brave. <laughs> I'd love to go, actually, one day as well. But we're going to get stuck into the action now. The 150 at Sandown kicks us off, and this is the Group 3 Coral Charge. It looks a very open race, Matt. Is that how they bet? It certainly is, yeah. I don't think it'll be any more wide open. It looks like a handicap for the way they're betting it. There you go. 11 to 2, co favours of 3. Don't forget, there's only 11 runners uh, in this. But I thought it was a really interesting makeup for a five furlong race. Not much pace uh, I didn't couldn't find going through these. You know, lots of these do like a burn up and to come from behind. And I think Ryan Moore on Marshman really does catch the eye from Stall 3. He didn't get out across uh, Lady Hamana and Tiber Flow, who you imagine would be held up. 
can get it to that rail, I think he's got a massive chance. But you say we're four places online on this one as well. And even so, you're not guaranteed a place. It's wide open. But I thought the lack of pace was an interesting angle here tactically. OK, well, Robbie, I'm going to start with you here. Please, yeah. Uh, the draw, I mean, that's obviously yeah. quite essential, right? Yeah, I mean, there's often trouble in running on the sprint track at Sandown, isn't there? Like, we saw it last year. Uh, Equilateral probably should have won, but he ended up finishing about sixth or seventh, beating two limps. Um, you don't exactly know how it's going to play out, but as Matt points out, the lack of potential pace is a bit of a worry. But um, I don't know, I think the sprinters keep on side, put him up early in the week, is equality. Um, I think he's, that Windsor run last time off of Mark 102, you don't often see sprints won by the best part of six lengths. I thought he was really impressive there. And he had a couple of excuses uh, on his two starts before that. I think he probably found the ground potentially too soft in the Palace House, and it's his first run back, I can forgive that. And then in the Temple Stakes, he was drawn one where there's a massive pace bias, the first four home rule in the top four stalls. So I just think this is a, an ex sprinter on the up, and uh, I'm not sure we can say the same about a lot of these. And you're getting, uh, I think, 13 to 2, I think that's a pretty fair price. And Kiel's obviously. Form-wise, the King's Stand is quite important, isn't it, here? Because plenty of them ran in it last time. Yeah, plenty of them ran in it. None of them got that close. Yeah. Um, obviously, Marshman finished seventh, uh, I think, beating just over five lengths. The time before that, he was third in a Group 2, the Prix, Prix de Grosjean at Chanty. And half a length in front of him was Get Ahead. And what I don't understand is that the um, BHA assessor seems to completely ignore, ignore that form. And... The left get ahead rated 102, which makes her look like she's got tons to find, but she clearly hasn't because she was giving three pound to Marshman then and she's getting a pound off him now. Um, obviously, that's that's weight for age. Um, but, you know, start of this season, Clive Cox, who's cracking with sprinters, uh, he said, I think she'll be, she'll be challenging for decent prizes this year. And on her last two starts, she's won very easily at Haydock. And she was in front after the line uh, at Chanty as well. And that is a really quick five furlongs. So, the winning time was dipped under 56 seconds. This race is very rarely won in under a minute. Right? And the stiff finish over five furlongs at, will absolutely suit her down to the ground. My one worry is if it does chuck it down, uh, because he says, and on the form, she doesn't want it soft. She does handle a bit of cut. Um, stall nine, um, you, you know, in the past, you'd have worried about that a lot of sand down because you want to be on that. You want to be on that far well sometimes, but not always. And just, I think four of the last seven winners of this was on six or higher, including came from the dark two years ago. He came from stall nine. So I'm not going to worry too much. Um, she'll drop in. She does travel. She definitely finishes. Uh, it's quite interesting. Pat Dobbs riding for the yard as well. Doesn't ride very often. But if you go and have a look at his stats on the five furlong sprint course, uh, there was good or better than pretty much every jockey in the race. I think apart from Jason Hart, who's only had, th who's only had three rides and one on one of them, his, his strike rate is better than all the other jockeys on that sprint course of Sandown. So connections have done their own work. They certainly have. Well, you alluded to the fact that you were quite excited about the card at Haydock, and that's where we're going to go next. The group two, Lancashire Oaks, nine of them line up here. Mile and a half is the distance. Um, Matt, how do they bet? Yeah, well, Mimikyu, of course, for last year's winning connection. Remember this race last year? It was really rough, wasn't it? Free wind and there was a shower, I think, wasn't it? Knocking each other over and free wind came through to win very comfortably. I'm not sure if Rob Avalon and Jim Crowley are still speaking after that. But it's Mimikyu, your favourite, at five to four on the back of that uh, reappearance from runner-up at York. Sea Silk Road, of course, won the Leicester Piggott contest at Haydock a few weeks ago. That's at nine to And I thought the, the uh, got an horse here. It was a risk, yeah. I mean, she lost both her shoes at York. She had an excuse for that one. And, you know, she was second to Nashua uh, in the um, in the Nassau of Goodwood and then won the Free Jean Romanet. If she hadn't run at York, I wonder what price she would be. I think she's the forgotten one. I think Mimic is too short. Kiels, I'll start with you this time. I think the favourite warrants her place at the top of the market. Do you agree? Uh, I think she does. I think she's remarkably talented. Um, a little bit concerned. She's ever, she can be ever so keen going, can't she? Like, you know, and she can... She can blow it, and they've taken the hood off, uh, which is which is very very interesting. So, you know, she has one at the track. Um, you know, I think she's the one to beat. Um, I don't think she's unbeatable. Um, it really annoyed me um, when Cecil Road won the Leicester Piggott race the other day because why didn't we think of that? <laughs> 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 After William, the race. William Haggis. I mean, he was. You know, I mean, she was clearly keyed up for that, and it was a it was a good win. I wonder whether she might bounce a bit from that because that was a very very hard race. I know it's a, almost four weeks ago now, but it is four weeks ago. Uh, I get the case for Aristia on, on back form, but she was back the other day and is a bit shorter now. I'm, I'm a little bit of a fan of a filly called Poptronic. I think she's improving. Now, she needs to, that's for sure. But 
I'd like to see her get a decent pace to run at. Um, all she did was stay on and stay on and stay on when, you know, she was a length and three quarters behind Sea Silk Road. She got out of pace halfway. She was only three lengths behind uh, free win the time before at York. Uh, and, you know, she's, she's just very, very consistent. She does need to find that a little bit more, but she is a double figure price in a race where you can get, uh, where you're getting three places. And I thought I'd take a little chance on her without being you know, massively confident. Um, the other one, Time Lock, she was quite weak in the betting in that Haydock race. She'd probably come on for that, and Harry and Roger Charlton are now flying. Robbie, what words yeah. of wisdom have you got to um, add to this? I sort of respect what Matt said about Aristia, um, because she is an unpenalised uh, Group 1 winner, but I'm not sure if she's a complete mile and a half horse. Um, I think Mimi Q's a shade short. I think she's probably a, a bit better of a, a mile six. Yeah. Um, I think Time Lock is quite interesting. Um, that pinnacle stakes is of normally a sort of good indicator for this, but it was very slowly run. There's more pace in it this time with Aristia and Peripatetic in there. They, they went no gallop whatsoever, and I don't think Time Lock was suited by that. She was sent off even money, but I mean, anyway, as Kiel says, the, the yard's in flying form, and the ground might have been a bit too quick for her that day. There's a bit of rain around. Um, I think that it's going to be more true a run, and she's going to be seen to better effect. I've always quite liked her. And um, I, I think she's definitely better than a, a mark of 102 and uh, eight to one sort of odds would make a bit of appeal to me. Good stuff. We're going to skip back to Sandown and focus on their three o'clock. This is the Coral Distar for three-year-olds over a mile. Matt, how do they bet here? Yeah, obviously uh, with Breeze now coming out, this uh, market's obviously just been reformed a little bit. It's been Stenton Glider uh, is now your market leader, of course. I think she's done by is it Sam Quek's uh, husband and mother-in-law, I think it is. Uh, with Andrew Zini, who heard his thoughts on that one. So she's in there, the favourite at five to two. Magical Sunset is at four to one. It's nine to two. So four to one now. So Bridestones, of course, got knocked over at Royal Ascot, and it's thirteen to two. Baldo. So yeah, it's a wide open distance. Yeah, Stenton Glider, we heard about uh, a little bit about her chances from Andrea, and it's it's a, certainly a, a horse that um, that he likes. Uh, ran in the English Guineas and was then second in the German Guineas, which was obviously a significant run last time, Robbie. Yeah, um, definitely definitely got a chance. I mean, German form can sometimes be underestimated, I feel. Uh, but I was, I don't know, I was looking, I was trying to be smart here and thinking Bridestones might sort of escape people's attentions because she was a big eye catcher in the Sandringham last time, but she's actually about four to one with Breach coming out. But uh, it, it's an interesting case to be made. Um, she definitely would have won her side of the track in the Sandringham. There was a real pace bias that day, uh, but she was just completely wiped out by the rail, by the far rail, and uh, lost her momentum, then rallied. Uh, she definitely would have beaten Magical Sunset there. I know she's worse off than Magical Sunset, but she's only run four times. She's very lightly raced. Um, open to a bit more on quicker ground, I think. She was mainly run on soft before. But, uh, I mean, she's only rated 93. It's interesting that they're risking squandering a, a handicap mark like that uh, for a race like this. And with Breeze coming out, I think this, this could be Bridestones, Bridestones for the win. What are you thinking, Kiels? Well, I, 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 I found it very hard. I mean, I'm not as hard as anti-post punters, uh, I hope, because obviously the first two in the bet, and Coppice was one of them, I can't remember the other one, they didn't even make the final decks. Then Breeze was in his favour, and she came out <laughs> you know, uh, uh, early enough. So um, we've got Stenton Glider now. I think she's probably the one to beat. I get the case for Bridestones. I've actually had a few quid on one, an even bigger price, who risked blowing the handicap mark even more. Uh, and that's William Muir and Chris Grassic trained Maggie's way. Now, all she's done is win a Mickey Mouse handicap at Nottingham off a of mark of 76, but I just love the way she did it. She clearly had tons in hand. She won by two lengths and I think three and three quarters or three and three, three and a half. And uh, the next two in the betting, um, you know, they were the right ones according to the market. They both went much closer to winning next time. Uh, and for them to chuck her in here, um, she must have been showing plenty within the next two months. We know how quick Philly's going to improve anyway. Um, I'm just very interested in the fact that they've thrown her because you can finish fifth and go up ten pound here. Like, you know, what I mean, you're, obviously with Phillies, you want to get that bit of black type, don't you? Um, but you want to eke out another handicap if you yeah, can. Yeah, I the mean, way. you know, what I mean, she, I mean, she'd be an absolute shoe in for a handicap of 84. I'm sure she would. Uh, so the fact that. Uh, the fact that they're going here just interests me a little bit. I don't think it's a, I don't, it's certainly not the hottest race now. Um, but, you know, she does have plenty to find. You've got to, you've got to concede that. But I think she was going to outrun a world. She travelled really, really well at Nottingham. Whether she'll do so in, in, in this much higher grade, we'll have to wait and see. But I just do like the fact that they've chucked her in here 
Um, I think, right, you know, we're going to go, for, we're going to go for this. You know what I mean? Because she could easily go up ten power for finishing fifth. Mm. Back to Haydock we go, this time for the Old Newton Cup. Now this is good prize money and it's always super competitive. Matt, how do they bet here? <laughs> yeah, bookmakers benefit, isn't it? We're five places each way uh, on it. So let's have a look at the beds in here. Laya Cal for uh, William Haggis is your market. He's got so W represented, of course, in these. He's also got Garcy for the team as well. Five to one, Laya Cal. Sheer Rocks, who won a bet for Derby weekend at uh, Epsom. Impressive than a hat trick, 13 to two. Cumulo Nimbus. Uh, Stuart Machen's commentator and hoping he'll be saying coming from the clouds, but he won't because he's a front runner. And Richard King's got an eye jockey, uh, eye catching jockey booking for how good he is from the front at uh, Haydock. And Max, so this is an interesting one. This was really well back the Royal Ascot. Uh, everyone who was anyone wanted to be on Max at a big price. He's now two pound lower than when second to Secret State Glorious Goodwood uh, last week. Had a kind of few excuses. I thought he went did too much too soon at Royal Ascot under Tom Marquand, and uh, I think he's certainly handicapped to win. So I think Max was interesting. And, of course, there's a footnote of this race as well with All Right Sunshine. He's got a good record at Haydock. The last runner from Keith Dark Leash's yard that he's going to send out. Maybe not forever, but obviously he's taking a bit of a career break. So uh, fingers crossed that All Right Sunshine goes well, and best luck to Keith. Kills, this is the kind of race that you come you come to your own. I feel like you've got, yeah, I feel like well, you've got I like something to, that's going to get yeah, you out of jail well, I think so. well, I, I hope it's going to be Maxed, actually. I mean, I, I backed him at 25 to my Well, that's good. I was actually quite surprised when he completely um, um, collapsed in the market. It was nothing to do with my little bet. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, as Matt said there, he just did too much too soon in a race that was run as a strong gallop, not quite as strong as a three-year-old handicap over the same trip, but still a strong one. Okita Sushi came from a long way back, and Maxed was right up there. Uh, from the off, so I think he did too much. I think he shaped a hell of a lot better than his final finishing position of 12 suggests. He was still only beating five and a half lengths, but he was right there a furlong and a half out. Uh, and, you know, going back to that, his best race last year was after Royal Ascot when he was second to Secret Straight, and that is an astounding piece of form uh, because he was beaten uh, just a length and a quarter by a horse who's, who's 10 pound higher now, um, you know, won a... Uh, uh, you know, ran a really, really good race, sorry, in a great vault wicker the next time out, finishing second. Uh, and the, the the third and fourth were Inverness and Solcom, who both won big handicaps at the end of the season, both went aboard and ran massive races and would both be an absolute minimum of £20 higher uh, than they are than they were then. Uh, and Max said he's £2 lower. Um, it's too good to give up on him being a good horse, I think. Uh, so I'm definitely going to give him another go. Uh, Huey Morrison seems to be in pretty good nick despite only one winner of his last 18. He's had a few seconds and that, so I don't think there's anything wrong there. Yeah. Um, so I like him by far the most. I have also had a couple of quid each way on Toshi Zoo, who seems to be an eye catcher every other time he runs. Um, just gets given miles too much to do, whatever the trip. Uh, and he's gone, you know, he's gone to you know, seven furlongs a mile and a mile or two last time at Epsom, where he was um, pretty much last turn of a home and then absolutely flew. Uh, and he's going up in trip again, not really, you know, you couldn't be absolutely certain that he'd get it, but if he does, at some point, he's going to fall in because he's very well handicapped on his Irish form now, I think. What do you think, Robbie? Yeah, I, well, I think La Leia Kell is plenty short enough um, first time out. I know Haggis had a returning favourite in the Northumberland Plate last week, didn't he? Post-impressionist, he completely drifted mm. like a barge. I'm, I'm not saying Leia Kell's going to do that again, but I would have thought one of his profile might have some like fancy few trenches, uh, nothing at all coming up. Um, I mean, yeah, he could win, but like you can't argue that he's any value at all. Uh, Camino Nimbus, I think he's probably a, a little bit short as well, to be honest. Um, I mean, he's won two very slowly run races where he's been able to dominate last time. I think there's a bit more pace in this this time. I don't think I'm not sure he truly stays a mile four. Um, so I, I mean, I totally agree with Kills on on Maxford. I mean, he was asked to do quite a lot last season. He only two months after his debut he finished fifth in the Hampton Court. Like this is a good horse. A lot of his form lines stack up, as Kills points out. And uh, you didn't want to be prominent in that Akita Sushi race at Ascot. He's down two pounds for it. I think he's definitely better than 97. And I don't think we're still at the bottom of Sheer Rocks. Uh, really impressive at Epsom last time. One, he's down. He's only got five pounds for that. He's just looked at different horses since being gilded. So that'd be my two, uh, two win bets in that race. And we've saved the best to last. The Coral Eclipse takes place at Sandown at 3.40. There are just the four of them here. And Matt, it's tight at the top, isn't it, with the betting? It certainly is, yeah, and obviously he flip-flopped early on the week when the decks came out, uh, but there we are, Paddington, even money favourites, Gavain O'Brien, a seventh 
winning the race. He'll be the winning most trainer if that one obliges. Then we look, John, at six to five. Uh, again, obviously, Dubai Honor will want the thick end of those uh, showers, a 20 mil that maybe Keel was talking about earlier, and 25 to one West Wind blows. Yeah, it looks a match, uh, but again, it's quality over quantity. Tactics are going to play a massive part. Uh, will the weight concession probably play in the favour of Paddington? I would imagine so. Um, I'd be with the favourite, but you know, again, tactics being a massive part here. Robbie, the classic generation against yeah. the older horses. What are looking, your thoughts on that at this time yeah, of year? Yeah, looking forward to it, Emma. Um, I mean, it's was well, proper two horse race on paper, but it's going to be. It could get messy with a potential lack of pay. It all de a lot of it depends on how quick Westman Blows goes. I think. I, I have a fear in my head that he won't go quick enough, and that will upset Emily Upjohn. She can be a keen goer sometimes, <clears> and that could compromise a vision effort. And Paddington might have too much speed for her. If it's a test of speed, then I'd. I'd back Paddington to win all day long, so that's going to be crucial. I'd just about side with Paddington, but uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just not sure this is the perfect setup for Emily Upjohn. I'm not doubting that she's proper top class. She looked brilliant at Epsom, but uh, I just think it might just play into Paddington's hands. Yeah, interesting. Keels, we were discussing this earlier, and you came out with a stat about how many Group 1s there are between yeah. the, over this trip, yeah, between well, this now why, and the King this George. Is why you, is, this is why you get small fields. It's between, you know, sorry, sorry, between the the Prince of Wales and the King George um, in Europe, there are 10 middle distance group ones now. Um, some, are, some are for filly, some are for three-year-olds, but they all pull from the potentially the same small, you know, oh. relatively small pool of horses. So that's why you only get small fields in, in, in most of the races. I mean, it's probably a long while since we've had a big field eclipse. We've got two very, very good horses, uh, but almost certainly a guaranteed tactical race at, at the same time. Uh, it'd be interesting. You know what happened when you know in, in the Prince of Wales we had five runners. We thought it was a, it was it was between three of them, and then Mostadaf comes out and and bashes the lot of them. Um, if it chucks it down with rain, Dubai Honor is not without a shout. Uh, it, was a, it was a dual um, Group One winner in Australia um, this year. The last one very easily on soft ground. So it all depends if it, if we do get the thick end of the, what they're forecasting on the thunderstorms before racing. He would become interesting. Otherwise, I do think it is between the two. I wouldn't be entirely certain that Paddington would outspeed Emily Upjohn because she was very fast in those sectionals for the Coronation Cup. Um, who do I favour? I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> this is not the kind uh, of race uh, you know what I mean. It's not it? my. It's not my sort of race. I will, you know, I will not back. I certainly won't back either of the front two because I don't bet at those sort of prices anyway. And it'd need an absolute deluge for me to get involved. Um, I quite like Paddington. I like the way he did it at Ascot. Um, and as Robbie said, Emily Up did. The worry with Emily Upton is not being outspeeded for me, but not settling. Yeah, exactly. Like Buick's taken over as well. He's never been there before. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, as good as William Buick is, and um, let's face it, we all love Frankie, but he's better than Frankie now. Frankie's only near the end of his career. So, you know, no worries about the jockey himself, but it's the jockey knowing the horse. Mm. Uh, it was funny enough, there was a new jockey on Mishriff last year. Uh, and he just wasn't ready for him to miss the kick, and that cost him the race. So it's, um, yeah, and there's more against Emily Upton, I think, than Paddington, but it's not a race I'll be playing. I'm with you. Paddington for me. Hey. Well, before we get stuck into our weekend naps, go check out racingpost.com slash freebets to see how you may be able to get £200 worth of free bets. So, best bets of the weekend. Matt, what have you got set up your sleeve for us? Well, it can't be any worse than last week, can we? So, <laughs> I'd love to see Uzo win the Coral Challenge of the 225. He was third in it last year off this same mark. He's a model of consistency, but I can't put a horse up. He's got a strike at a four and 32. And I was really buoyed by both Keels and Robbie, like you, Maxud as well, in the old Newton Cup. So, that'll form part of some plan. But I think for the best bet, I'm going to go... It's a sand down in the 450. Uh, new business. It was all the rage for the wood ditter. It was back to it was out of the question. Looked quite professional, but didn't kick out the dip from behind passenger in that. Was far too keen at York. It was a hot maiden behind Most of Cheer, of course. And the St. James's Palace. And then Z, I, mean, I think you can mark up his run uh, when fifth in the Golden Gates as well. So I thought that was a decent run despite him pulling up his head. And then he put all that behind him when making all. At Kempton. I think if you could have told uh, in the wood dip and the way the market went, they'd be able to back this horse in a couple of runs off eight to seven. He snapped your hand off. I think he's well ahead of his market. 
He's got an entry in the international handicap on King George today as well. So it could, be, it could be a good day for him on Andrew Bonner's new business in the fourth day. I love it. Great minds think alike. New business is my nap of the day too for Andrew Balding. You've just made the best possible case for him. Um, and I think he'll take a lot of beating in that race too. So, Snap. Um, Kiels, you next? Uh, yeah, I'm quite a big fan of Uzo as well that, that, that Matt mentioned. Um, he's got a very good record at Sandown. Uh, and was an unlucky third in the race last year. But I'm going to get ahead. I think she's a sprinter going places. And hopefully... Uh, the rain won't get in too much. And Robbie, fresh from his holiday, here yeah, with let, ammunition. Let's, let's hit the ground running. Uh, I'm going to go bright, even though, the, actually no, I was going to do Bridestones, but she's a bit short on the morning, so I'm going to go 240 head at Langstroke, it's time lock. The race can be better run to suit, a bit of ease in the ground. She'll be, she's a good filly, we haven't seen the best of her yet. Good stuff, Robbie. That's our best bets for the weekend, three of which come from Sandown and Robbie's at Haydock. Some of the horses this weekend may have the Breeders' Cup very much on their agenda and their schedule. How would you like to join them in November? Well, the Racing Post have a great competition. Here's how you get involved. Matt, thanks for joining us once again on the programme. What are the plans for the weekend? I'm going to chill, watch the racing tomorrow. Looking forward to that. I'm going to a musical on uh, Saturday night. And, but yeah, a quiet one because from next week with the darts and black for the Betfred World match, that is going to be a manic. So uh, a little bit of a quieter one. Good stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Robbie? Yeah, I mean... Soaking up a few rays today or not? Uh, yeah, it's quite hot actually, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, I thought I caught the sun from going to France, but I'm not looking the most tanned. Um, we had the race post summer party on Wednesday. I'm still feeling the pinch from that, so I just want to relax really, Emma. Well, I'll be watching this for sure. Okay, good stuff. And Kiels? Uh, You'll be looking yeah. after the um, the load of animals no, that I've no, recently no, no, discovered no, no, you've no, got no, at home. No, 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 no. Rabbits, I've got, I've got a dogs, I've got a daughter to do all of that for me, so I will be at Sandown, first in, last out, hopefully. Is it your uh, favourite race day of the year? Uh, one of. Yeah, one of. I really do. It's local as well. Yeah. Well, you know, it can take me about 15 minutes to go over in a taxi uh, when I stagger into one when I walk out the track. So, yeah, it's great. I love it there. And you know what you're doing, confidently armed uh, with ammunition? Well, I hope so. It'd be a while since I had a good eclipse meeting, to be fair. But um, I, normally, I normally go in confident and then get it knocked out of me race by race. <laughs> what are you doing this weekend? Then? Um, I'm going to Wimbledon on Sunday. Oh, nice. Yeah. Brilliant. I haven't been for a couple of years. Right. I haven't been for years. You, uh, what, uh, you just sit on the hill or are you actually in there? And... Yeah. No, I'm on no. to go on. <laughs> Oh, I knew it. Hospitality as well. well. What's that? Hospitality as well. No, no hospitality. <laughs> a few drinks and, and yeah. no, I'll be. Uh, oh, I like a I bit of Wimbledon it. actually. Ah, Wimbledon's great. I'm not sure who's playing yet because I suppose it depends on what happens today. Yeah, too early to say. We'll find. We'll find out on Saturday. Okay, good stuff. What else? Um, a day at home, fairly quiet tomorrow, which is quite nice, nice and so. quite rare. So. Oh yeah, well, soak it up. Yeah, I will. I will. I might catch a few rays this afternoon as well. Thank you both very much. We will see you again soon. And thank you for tuning in to What A Shout.